Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Good morning. It's good to see you here. Welcome. If you are visiting with us, we do this every Sunday, and we'd like for you to do it with us. And also, that little pad there on the end of the pew, fill it out. Put as much information in it as you're willing to give us, so we'll have a record of your attendance with us today. The adult choir will practice after worship today. If you've been thinking about joining, now's the time. Come join us right after choir, uh, right after worship. <laughs> Mat makers, when, uh, Monday, all afternoon. Weight watchers on Tuesday at noon. And we have an anniversary, the Polans. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> all right. And intercessory prayer on Wednesday at 11. The youth group meets that night at 6. Uh, Ruth Circle. Men, the women meet, but we get to eat with them. They have a lunch after. Please come. 10.30 Thursday morning, Ruth Circle in the Fellowship Hall. We have a birthday, Becky Hughes. Happy birthday. Uh, word about the Sunday school, two adult classes. Fall festival. Come tell us about it. Good morning. Um, the Fellowship and Activities Ministry have our next event planned, and that's going to be our Fall Festival event on October the 6th. Um, it will be immediately following worship, and we have got a ton of really cool activities planned, so we're going to invite everyone, um, if you're planning to stay, dress casually, please. Um, we have a pumpkin decorating contest and Blake's gonna show you a couple of slides now because this is a non-carving contest. So these are some examples. Those are bare, like uh, heads on, stuffed heads on the wall and s'mores, um, a candied apple uh, or caramel apple, a porcupine or hedgehog. So that's the type of decorating that we mean because we're not doing carving because uh, quite honestly, I don't wanna clean up pumpkin guts. Um, I'm lazy. Um, so minimal carving, I'll give everyone who signs up a, a few more rules when we get closer to time, but there is a sign-up sheet out on the bulletin board, and uh, this is uh, hopefully a team competition, so grab two or three people that you'd like to do a pumpkin with, and we need just one person to sign up uh, for each team, and that way I'll know how many pumpkins to buy. Um, so you'll have until the last Sunday in September to do that. Um, so that I can get them and have them here for the first Sunday, which is when we'll, our fall festival will be. We're also going to have things like a giant sorry board, a giant Jenga. Some of you guys had a really good time playing Jenga. Um, so we've got the big ones. We're going to have that. Uh, and Yardsy, which is like Yahtzee, but big dice. Um, and uh, it's going to be potluck, but uh, the ministry is going to provide fried chicken and uh, chicken tenders and all the beverages. So please plan to come. It's going to be a great time. Bring your favorite dish, and uh, we'll just all fellowship together. Thanks. Let us worship God. <laughs>
Our call to worship today is from Psalm 100. Shout for the Lord, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, as you once came among the multitudes, ministering to their individual needs, so come among us here, that through your Spirit, you may minister to our needs, so that we will rise up with new courage, be filled with new hope, experience new power, face life with new resolution able to turn the problems of life into opportunities for growth. O oh God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hear us as we worship you. Amen. It rises as we sing number 93, Thousand Tongues to Sing. <laughs> your time. Come on down. Great. Small crowd. Good to see you all. How was your week? Tiring, yeah. Well, for you, Mackenzie. I have a gift for you since you had such a tiring week. It's my driver's license. Um, because you are, in fact, born in 2001, 5'4", um, and uh, your name is Amelia Shelton, correct? Yes. Um, do you think, you, and you have taken your driver's test, right? Yeah. And you, you've had your permit, gone through the process, and then gotten your license, and you're now an adult, right? Right? So this will be super useful for you. Right? Right. Um, you can also use this to like vote and stuff. So I'm just, you want it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tiring because you went, you aged like 10 years. You, it was a really tiring week because of all those reasons. So tomorrow, whenever I have to go into work, I'm just going to be you, right? I, like I, I, w I won't need my license. I'll, I'll still be fine. Like, I'll, I'll be good to go. If the police officer pulls me over, he'll just let me go because I'll say McKenzie has it, right? Yeah. So there. do you think that McKenzie can actually use this license very well and get away with it? You know, we both have brown hair, but we don't look that much alike, do we? And there's obviously the age discrepancy here. 
uh, there are certain tools that we have in life that for some people work super well and for others not so much, right? Like a person who uh, needs to use a wheelchair for mobility um, aren't really going to benefit from, say, crutches a lot of the time because maybe they don't have the, mus the muscle mass to be able to use crutches. Or somebody who has the stomach flu isn't really going to benefit from headache medicine because those two don't really go together very well. That's kind of what we're talking about in church, right? So there are all sorts of different gifts that God gives us, right? And he may not give those exact same gifts to other people. Like, I'm sure that, Ephraim, there are so many things that you're great at that I'm not super good at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, video games. I am so bad at video games. And Ephraim is super good at that, but I don't need to be because I'm not Ephraim. Yeah. I don't need to be super good at all the things that Ephraim is good at because I'm not Ephraim. Mackenzie doesn't need my driver's license because she's not me. Here in a few years, she'll get her own driver's license that has her own name and picture, et cetera, et cetera, all the information that she needs to give a police officer when she gets pulled over because it does happen. <laughs> so with all of these tools, it can sometimes feel a little bit of a bummer to not be good at the things that other people are good at. Like, I'm sure that there are times that McKenzie wants to go off and do things that are super fun, but she can't because she can't drive. She doesn't have her license. She's not old enough to yet. But at all times, we will get what we need, right? In its own time, we will get what we need to drive, to play video games, to whenever we were little, we couldn't read, but we had parents who could help us read or grandparents or older siblings. And then eventually we learned how to read, and that was a super cool new gift. So God will give, give us the tools that we need in the time that we need to get them. And it can seem kind of like a bit of a bummer to not have those things earlier whenever we really, really want them. But that may not necessarily be whenever we really, really need them. When I was at McKinsey's age, I did not need to know to drive. That would have been very bad. I would have had no money. I would have just been driving to the mall every day. It would have been a real problem. But once I was older and I had more responsibility and I was taller, it was something that I needed to get a job, to go to school. It was an important tool, right? So as we go through the next stressful weeks that Mackenzie has driving and being 22 all of a sudden, we need to remember that these tools that we have are ours because God needed us to have them, because in our lives we needed to have them, right? All right, you guys want to come up and pray with me? You can do hands or elbows. Elbow? Okay. After me, dear God, we thank you for the tools that we have to live our lives. Amen. Please rise for number 466. Jesus, I have promised. <laughs>
call to give this morning is also from Psalm 100. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. We often talk about the need of giving to the church because the church, in a very real sense, is like any other business in our world today. It cannot exist without monetary gifts from you and me. But in a more real sense than that, the church is you and me praising God every day, thanking him for what he's done and is doing in our life and in our church. And a lot of what goes on in the church is because of your faithfulness and mine in giving to God a worthy offering. So with joy in your hearts for what God has done for you, give God his tithe and your morning offering. Let us pray. Father God, you have planted within us gifts and graces like seeds that can develop and grow, plants that can blossom and be beautiful. Help us never to be afraid, for where there is great risk, there is also great blessing. We believe you call us to both blossom where we are planted and to grow in new places of service where we have never been before. So take us and take these offerings that together we may grow and your kingdom grow in our world and our world by that offering, by our ministry, may experience your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. 
We turn now in God's Word to Mark's Gospel. I ask you to turn with me and follow along as I read in, aloud in chapter 7. Mark's Gospel, chapter 7. We're going to read verses 24 to 30. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied. But even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her. For such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Brothers and sisters, the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. We take time now for prayer. I ask you to turn on the back of the bulletin, look at the prayer list if you haven't already. By the by, why don't you take that the bulletin home with you so that you'll have this handy every day when you pray that you can pray for those who've asked for our prayers if there are others that you would like for us to remember or a particular concern that you'd like for us to know about if you'll do that in the silence out loud we would appreciate it after the silence I'll lead in a prayer and we'll conclude with our Lord's prayer let us pray Our Heavenly Father, it does seem like that this is the only time in our week, the only place that we go, that we can sit in peaceful silence. Yet even in this peaceful silence, the world's problems, our problems, intrude upon our consciences. We hear the rumblings of what we want to do for the rest of the day. We think on the needs that we have in the coming week. And so even in this peaceful silence, we cannot let go of our problems. So by the Holy Spirit, would you at this moment come into each of our lives and shut out all of the demons that possess us and all of the problems that seek to overwhelm us. And as you come, let us experience again that still, small voice of comfort that tells us we are your children, that you love us, everyone. Indeed, as the prophet would say, you have our names engraved on your hand. You can never, ever forget us. Oh God, as you are with us, so will be with those that we love, with those that we're concerned about, with those on our prayer list, with those round about us who are going through difficult days. Love them. 
keep them as only you can. And then when we are joined together with them, may we enjoy and in celebration praise our God and Father who looks after us and keeps us through every care. All this we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Have you ever been so desperate, so very, very desperate, that you're willing to do? the unthinkable. You'll do it because there's no other option. Because there's no other solution. And hope against hope. Maybe, just maybe, it'll work. And you put your hope in that possibility. I think one of the hardest parts of my being an army chaplain was trying to help soldiers and their families solve their problems. Young people, generally 18 to 20, 25 or so, in my adulthood, <laughs> critical parent mind, <laughs> I'd say, what have you got to be concerned about? <laughs> but they had problems. And they would come to me asking me to help them. It wasn't any genius on Carlton Harper's part. It had to be the Holy Spirit that when they would come and they would tell me that there is no good solution, I hit upon the idea of, well, let's think about the best bad solution that will get you working toward a good outcome. Here we are today trying our best to live a happy life. Sometimes, though, sometimes you've got to walk through a lot of valleys to ever get to one mountaintop. I'm talking today about those times in your life and mine when we're literally at the end of our rope. <laughs> there was a funny expression in the army, I, at least I thought it was funny. Uh, you'd hear them sometimes say when, when you're struggling with something, somebody would say, well hold on to what you got. Sometimes what I got ain't much. <laughs> and so today we have this woman. This unnamed woman in Mark chapter 7 who understands being at the end of your rope. She does the unthinkable who in her desperation makes a leap of faith into the arms of Jesus. She doesn't know him. She's never met him. But she must have heard about him. Maybe. Maybe, just maybe, what she's heard is true. She has great pain. She has pomposity, but she has perseverance. Those 
three words of alliteration, pain, pomposity, and perseverance, describe her, I think, so very, very well. Her pain is a pain that every parent knows and understands when it comes to your child. I think it was in the 1950s movie, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, that I first heard the word. It was something in the way Burl Ives said it that intrigued me. I can hear him in my mind's eye now saying it, pomposity. He pronounced every syllable, pomposity. It intrigued me so that the first time I heard it, I went to the dictionary. I know I'm old-fashioned. Today you'd Google it. But I go to the dictionary. And what does the dictionary say the word pomposity means? Conceit. Overconfidence. Arrogance. I've often thought that if they wanted to be biblical about it, they'd say there also, see the woman in Mark 7. We have to ask, how could this woman, this Gentile woman, be so pompous? But to answer the question, we must first know the context of the story. It says in the beginning of chapter 7 that Jesus left that place. That place is the little village of Bethsaida. In Hebrew, it's house of the hunter. It's on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And now he goes north up the coast to the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. Biblical historians tell us this is the farthest he'll ever be in his earthly life from Jerusalem, a little less than 200 miles. He's in Gentile territory. Surely, in Gentile territory, he can get away from it all. Nobody will know him. He can have a little R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. Or as I've said it today, uh, he can go on vacation. Uh, have you noticed the front of the bulletin? I can't claim to have found this. But when it was brought to my attention, I thought, how... Funny. How apropos. <laughs> Can't you just see Jesus on a surfboard on his vacation? <laughs> I don't think he did, probably. Uh, the waves are not that big on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, she barges right in to Jesus. And without preamble or introduction, she speaks to Jesus. She try, uh, Jesus tries to dissuade her. He says in verse 27 that it's not right to give the children's food to the dogs. He's being insulting to her. Believe me, in those days, dogs were not what we have today. It was a term of disrespect to call a person a dog. But because of her pain, maybe she isn't so pompous after all, but she is persistent. She knows what she wants more than, than she knows her needs. She will do anything to get it. Often she and we confuse our wants and needs. What I want oftentimes is too much for my wallet. But I still want it. But I certainly don't need it. I remember a long time ago now that one Christmas my daughter came to me and was telling me all of the things that Santa was going to bring her. And at the end, she said, 
Daddy, I need it. Aren't we like that with our Heavenly Father? I need it. She needed Jesus to intercede. This Syrian Phoenician woman will do whatever it takes to get help for her daughter. She won't stay in her place. She won't accept that Jesus is only for the Jews. She doesn't out anger to being called a dog. In the Greek, it's little dog to distract her. She's willing to accept a crumb. Even a little blessing. A little blessing from Jesus. Because she knows it's more than what she'll ever get from the world around her. So Jesus relents and gives her what she wants. He heals her daughter. Why? Because she's willing to be thought of as a pompous woman. Uh, we'd say it today, a pushy woman. Matthew's gospel tells the story, and it's in chapter 15 of Matthew's gospel, of this same story. And he gives, in Matthew's account, he gives a fuller explanation of this woman, and then he has Jesus, remember, remembering Jesus, he says that Jesus tells her, woman, you have great faith. Think of that. The Savior of the world says to this Gentile, nobody of a woman, you have great faith. Wow, this woman doesn't have mustard seed size faith. She has oak tree size faith. Without another word, she goes home. She takes Jesus at his word. Jesus said her daughter is healed. She believes it. At this moment, she has no proof. It's important to hang on to that so when you think of this woman in your own life and how you'll apply her story to your life. At this moment, she doesn't know it physically for a fact. But she goes home. What do we do when somebody tells us to just believe it? What's your name now? Uh, it's now the 15th of September. It's now 20 minutes to 12. And your name is, how do you spell that? We get it down in writing so that we can say, I was told. I haven't written a check in months. I started to say years. It's been a long time. I don't remember the last time I wrote a check. I used my debit card. I'm amazed at the number of times that a clerk will say to me when I use my debit card, do you want a receipt? And I laughingly tell them, well, my boss doesn't mind me using the debit card. She just wants a receipt when I do. <laughs> what do we do? What do we do when we're told something is a fact and we don't have any proof of it? It's almost too hard to accept. This pain-filled, pushy woman in her persistent faith knows that Jesus has made a difference in her life and her daughter's life. She understands small portions. She understands that faith, even her faith, makes the difference. It's like when you and I come together for the Lord's Sunday on the first Sunday of every month. To the outside world, they don't understand 
How can the Lord's Supper satisfy your needs? Why, it's only a, a tiny little piece of bread. It's only a sip of the fruit of the vine. It won't make any difference in your life. But to those of us of faith, we understand. We understand it's our hope-filled faith combined with God's freely offered grace that makes all the difference. With this woman and the psalmist, let us pursue God. Let us urge God. Let us say to God, do good, O Lord, to those who are upright in heart. Well, that's a wonderful story. Uh, we could quit right now and everybody feels good. <laughs> we even got out early. <laughs> but where's the application for your faith and mine? Where's the application for your Christian practice and mine? If we just allow the woman's story to be her story and not our own. As the great philosophers of our world would say, ah, <laughs> there's the rub. One of the greatest 20th century preachers was disciple of Christ minister, Dr. Fred Craddock. He was a great storyteller. And he tells the story in one of his books about a missionary in India during World War II. And at Christmas time of 1945, his superiors said that he could come home on furlough and they sent him money to buy a ticket on a boat ship to come home. And so on Christmas day of 1945, he goes down, walks down to the dock to buy his ticket. And as he's walking along the dock, he notices a boat tied to the dock with a lot of people getting off the boat. And he can tell by their dress and by the way they are, are talking that they are Jews. And so he says to them, as he passes by, Merry Christmas! And one person said, we don't celebrate Christmas. He said, oh, that's all right. Uh, uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, what would you like for Christmas? Well, one person in particular stopped and began to think and said, you know, I would really, really like to have the sweet cakes that I had back home. If I could just have one of those sweet cakes, it would be so nice. And so he turns around and goes and finds a bakery and uses his furlough money to buy pastries for the Jews and takes them back and passes them out. <laughs> Quite naturally, then, he had to send a telegram to his superiors and ask for more money. And they said, well, what did you do with the money we sent you? Well, I bought sweet cakes for Jews. Why would you buy sweet cakes for Jews? They're not Christian. No, he said, but I am. We are to practice our faith even with those who don't believe as we do. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, in chapter 9 of the first letter in verse 22, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I've always wanted to argue with Paul at this point. Wait a minute, Paul. If I'm going to become all things to all people, I'm going to so order my life 
that I am going to be everything I can be to them to bring them to the Lord. I want to save all of them. But Paul says, some. It reminds you and me that we're not going to be able to speak the gospel to everyone we meet. But could you say the gospel as you've experienced to just one? Could you today, and you'll have the opportunity today, I guarantee it, today, would you take the opportunity to say the gospel as you understand it to just one? I don't know when I learned it, but oftentimes in my mind, I'm saying this little prayer that was set to a tune, it's a little chorus. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I nobly do my part to win that soul for thee. That's how we make the Syrian Phoenician woman story our own when we're willing to go to Jesus and then after receiving the blessing, even the small blessing, to go out into our world and proclaim that one blessing to someone who desperately needs to hear it. I hope you'll memorize that little prayer. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I do, may I nobly do my part to win that soul for thee. Desperate times call for a great faith. Let us pray. Lord God, in these moments of dedication, we want to be honest with you and most especially with ourselves. And so help us at this moment to be honest enough to say that we have received blessings beyond number and give us the courage to proclaim those blessings to our world that all may know that Jesus truly is Lord. In his blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. We stand together to affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. Please stand with me. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. challenge you today to let the Syrian Phoenician woman's witness be a part of your witness to win some one soul for Jesus. 
We sing now our hymn 535. 535. 535. <laughs> Please pray for our pastor, Larry, as he's out about doing general assembly business. He'll be back with us next week. Let us receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and take care of you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon you and dwell with you forever. Amen. Thank you.